This is Duke University. Good morning, how's, how's everyone doing? Good morning. Good. 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 Um, welcome to the 2013 Duke University Energy Conference. My name is Mark McDonald. And I'm George Wren. Uh, we are both uh, second year pupil students and co chairs of the conference. So, um, thank you for being here this morning. This is a student led event, um, which I think is fairly uncommon for, for events of this scale. So, we were uh, very glad that you're here. So, the, the purpose of today uh, is to bring together thought leaders in industry, government, and academia uh, to fuel discussion on the hot topics of energy policy, energy markets, energy technology, and energy market, uh, <laughs> energy uh, trends that are, that are forthcoming. Um, we, we truly believe that Duke University is in a unique position in terms of... You, you might sign part. Sorry? Use George's sign. Okay. Uh, so we, we truly believe that, that Duke University is in a unique position in terms of the academic breadth um, as well as focus on the energy space. Um, there are many different schools, so we have an engineering school, there's the business school obviously which you are in, public policy, and uh, the School of the Environment. And we, we truly believe that this is a great place for energy. Uh, we're looking forward to the discussions today um, to, to learn more about the challenges and um, opportunities that, that face the industry. And before we get started, we would like to first thank everyone that helped made this happen. Uh, first off is our, our sponsors. Um, without our sponsors, this, we would not be here today. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Secondly, um, we would like to thank all of the student organizers that are here today. This has been months in the making, and without everyone's help, uh, this would not have happened. So if you had a hand in creating this, please stand up. <laughs> uh, lastly, I, I would like to thank the FUCA students that are here. Um, uh, there was a Halloween party last night, and I think some of you are dragging a little bit, so <laughs> that's okay. Um, and just to, just to let you guys know, uh, George and I are, are hot on the job search, um, and your resumes, are, are, our resumes rather, are under your seat, and they are free to take. Uh, you, can, you can approach us a after we speak. Um, so we have, we have a great series of events today. Uh, we'll kick it off with a fantastic keynote, uh, followed by six panels, uh, three and three, two concurrent at a time, and uh, cap it off with um, an awesome ending keynote, with, which is a very timely one in terms of the topic. It will be on um, unconventional oil and gas in the U.S. Um, so that'll be great. And then to follow up with that is an energy mix is we, what we call it here. But it's basically a networking event um, with some, some food and drinks. So we, we look forward to that. With that, I'll leave it to George to kick off our opening keynote. All right. So I would like to introduce our opening keynote speaker of the conference. He is the executive director of the Energy and Enterprise Initiative based at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. He founded and launched the National Grassroots Organization in July 2012. Prior to that, he represented South Carolina's fourth congressional district for 12 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. He was first elected to Congress in uh, 1992 and having never run for public office before. He grew up in uh, Bluffton, South Carolina, graduated from Duke University with a degree in political science, and earned his law degree from the University of Virginia. And so without further ado, I'd like to present Bob Inglis. Great, thank you. So thank you very much. It's fun to be at Duke. You know, the best thing about Duke was uh, meeting my girlfriend here. Um, uh, she's now my wife of the last 31 years, and so uh, I won't tell you the year that she graduated, because you know that gets offensive, but I graduated in 1981, the previous century, and um, 
very much enjoyed uh, being here at Duke. I'm also looking around the room to see if any of my students, I, I taught the Nicholas School in the spring of 2012, and I'm worried that I tell some stories here today that say, we've heard that one, we've heard that one. Anybody here in one of my, in my class? I don't see anybody. Oh, wait a minute, I said, do you see, hello. How are you? Okay, so he's gonna go press play, you know? We've heard this, or uh, fast forward, we'll get through that story, English. Great to see you. So, um, uh, speaking of sort of dates, you know, this is, um, you see that, uh, this thing at the bottom right there is sort of like a, um, I suppose, a, uh, a tombstone, um, you know, of a political tombstone, you know, it's the years you lived and died or something. Um, uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, there's a tombstone that says, uh, here lies a lawyer and an honest man, and that indicates that times are tough. They're burying him two in a grave now, you know, if uh, that's the case. But uh, that's, I suppose, for business school students thinking about law lawyers, right, is that would be the case. Uh, couldn't be possible for somebody to be a lawyer and an honest man. But I actually am a lawyer as well. So, um, um, so uh, I am here to um, uh, really get uh, some help from you on, um, on uh, figuring out how to market something. Um, and our, our audience, uh, that we're after is conservatives. Um, conservatives that we're trying to reach uh, for action on energy and climate. Um, so at this point, perhaps I should have a picture of a windmill so I could go tilt against one, right, is probably what you're thinking. Um, uh, if you're a progressive, that's what you're thinking. Perhaps you go tilt against windmills and listen, see if you can get that done. Um, so. Uh, but here's, uh, I, I should give you some background about why it is that I come to this with such passion. Um, I was in Congress, as you see there, for two uh, different periods of time. Um, I thought that last one was gonna go on a lot longer. I, I, um, I had gotten there in a miraculous election in 1992, um, self-imposed term limit uh, ended in 1998, running for the Senate unsuccessfully in South Carolina. Um, Note to self, do not challenge 32-year incumbent in 70% right track territory. It will not work well for you. Um, and so lost that Senate race, returned to the practice of commercial real estate law, and then ran again in 04. Um, the reason that's relevant is that uh, it tells you why i am come to this issue of energy and climate with some passion, is that uh, you'll see that there are some scars from engagement on this issue. So. In 04, um, my son came to me and said, uh, Dad, I'm voting for the first time. You know, he's just turned 18. My wife and I have five kids, a uh, son and then four daughters. So he said, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. And um, because he knew that in English 1.0, as we called it, the first six years, that I had, for example, poo pooed climate change. I said, it's Al Gore's imagination, a bunch of nonsense. Um, total ignorance on my part, hadn't looked into it at all. All I knew was Al Gore was for it and therefore I was against it. Um, that was the end of the analysis. Um, and so I had this new constituency starting in 04. My son, his four sisters, my wife, all of whom could change the locks on the doors. And so um, I had to respond to this constituency and um, that was step one of three steps in a change of emphasis here. Second step was getting on science committee when I get back to uh, Congress for that second tour of duty, uh, or recidivism, whichever way you look at it. Um, and um, so got on the science committee, went to Antarctica, saw the evidence in the ice core drillings. So we can go into that if you want to. Um, and then the third step was amazingly a second opportunity to go to Antarctica. By the way, if you ever run for Congress, don't worry about going to Antarctica. Nobody will criticize you if that is not considered a junket because it's cold um, and it's really pretty uncomfortable in some ways. But don't go, if you represent a district like it's in the winter, don't go to a warm place with you know, beaches and then you'll get criticized. But if you go to Antarctica, no problem. So I went to uh, Antarctica a second time and got inspired by an Aussie climate scientist um, who uh, I figured out shared my worldview really just by watching his interaction with the creation as we were snorkeling and looking at uh, coral bleaching, that really he was worshiping God in the creation, not the creation, but the God behind the creation. And um, 
afterwards he had time to talk and uh, he told me about basically changing his life in order to love God and love people, people that he would never know, uh, by doing things like riding his bike to work uh, and various other things. Changing his life to love God and love people. And so I was inspired by that. I thought, this is pretty awesome. I want to be like Scott. And so I came home and introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Another note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in the midst of great recession. Um, that won't go well for you either. Um, and so, but that's what I did. Introduced a uh, revenue neutral carbon tax. Um, so, um, uh, as a result, uh, they were having a tea party um, in uh, June of 2010 in, a, in South Carolina's fourth district. And for some reason, I was specifically uninvited to said tea party. Um, I thought I was a pleasant enough fellow, should get an invitation, but they uninvited me big time. Um, so, uh, I identified with Rick Perry, you know, spectacular face, face plants. Um, uh, I got only 29% of the vote uh, in that Republican primary. Having won, by the way, in 2004, 85% of the vote. Um, and then to go from 85% down, down to 29%, really you can use my political life up there in that second half of that tombstone as a measuring life for action on energy and climate. And I think it has to do with the economic dislocation that came from the Great Recession and the fact that we, prior to the Great Recession, were interested in taking action on this uh, because the economy is pretty good, and therefore we were pretty high up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We were reaching for self-actualization. We can deal with this climate change thing. Um, but then the Great Recession, we got busted to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And basically people said to me in that Republican primary, English, sounds like something you're talking about is a decade or two away, man. We're worried about this month's mortgage, this month's paycheck out of here. Um, and so having been tossed out of Congress, I decided that um, you know, when you're branded as a heretic, you may as well just go right down Main Street proclaiming it now. You know I mean? So, so but I'm, uh, I'm here to suggest to you that um, maybe it's not so heretical. And I'm particularly excited to be in a business school context because you can really help us validate that proposition. Um, and if you do help us validate it, it will mean that conservatives can see, oh, you mean we're not talking some altruism here, where you got to count on the sugar daddy lasting with some fickle tax incentives or clumsy government mandates or some kind of clumsy regulations. Rather, a free enterprise fix that makes it so you fix the economics and the environmental problem fixes itself. Because we at the Energy Enterprise Initiative are convinced that this is mostly an economics problem, not an environmental problem. Um, so it's uh, more like dealing with the IRS than dealing with the EPA um, is where we're looking for a solution. Um, and so what I want to do is just very quickly present to you what we think is the solution. And this, by the way, no death by PowerPoint. This is the last slide. Whew. Um, uh, is that's it. That, what you're seeing there is a plan. Basically what we want to figure out a way to do is to um, make it so the free enterprise can fix climate change by having a true cost comparison between competing fuels. Eliminate all the subsidies for all the fuels. Whoop! At that point if you're planning on going into wind, <laughs> you're gasping for air, right? Because uh, I just destroyed the wind industry by saying we're going to eliminate all subsidies for all fuels. But hold on, you will live again if we eliminate the biggest subsidy that exists, which is the ability to belch and burn for free without accountability. If you say to those incumbent fuels, bear all your cost, be fully accountable, um, then wind breathes again and solar has a future, depending on where you are and what the circumstances are. Uh, so our, our concept is that uh, we have these incumbent fuels that benefit from this massive non-recognition of negative externalities. I can say that here. You know, I once said that to a reporter from the Greenville News. 
the district I represent, by the way, is Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina, probably the reddest district and the reddest state of the nation. Anybody want to fight me for that honor? I mean, maybe you're from somewhere you think you're redder than we are, but I think we're pretty much the reddest district and the reddest state in the nation. But I said to the Greenville News reporter, I said something about internalizing negative externalities. He said, well, I'll come again with that. And I said, I, internalizing negative externalities. He said, I can't write that in this paper, man. We've got to write to the seventh grade level. I said, OK, so we're going to re reveal the hidden cost. He said, OK, that'll work, that'll work. Um, but basically, that's what we're after, right? It's a thing that you know about, which is that there's a, a market distortion created by the fact that there are some players in the marketplace who get to belch and burn for free. You eliminate that subsidy, and, uh, and now we've got a true cost comparison between competing fuels. Um, so uh, as you see here, it's a very limited role for the government. This should turn conservative cranks, right? Um, we're not asking the government uh, to expand. In fact, we insist on it being revenue neutral. That's government speak for there's going to be a tax cut that precedes the imposition of a carbon tax. Um, so an equal amount, dollar for dollar tax swap. Uh, we're ecumenical at the Energy and Enterprise Initiative about what the tax cut should be. Uh, we'd be happy if it was a corporate tax reduction. Uh, that's what American Enterprise Institute would, would say, for example. Um, we'd be happy if it's a personal income tax reduction. Uh, we'd be happy if it's a FICA tax reduction. Or we'd be uh, OK with a dividend, where you collect up the, uh, the carbon tax revenue and you dividend it back to the taxpayers per capita. Um, that is not quite as desirable as the other three, because those other three create the possibility of a double dividend, where you get economic growth. The dividend, uh, the, uh, the, the sending the money back to the taxpayers doesn't get you that uh, economic growth, as I understand it. Uh, by the way, I wasn't a I'm not a scientist. I played one on the science committee, and apparently I'm now playing an economist, and I'm not one of those either. Uh, but uh, you're used to that with members of Congress. Uh, you know, they, they say things that they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, so, um, um, but, uh, but I think I know that this is uh, bedrock conservatism, and it fits with what we believe is conservatives. Now, um, uh, here in a minute, I'm going to stop and hear your questions and comments, because I'm going to start by posing a question for you. But before I get to that, I've got to tell you the other imperative for us. We only have two imperatives at the Energy and Enterprise Initiative. One is that um, it be revenue neutral, that uh, there has to be a dollar for dollar swap here. It can't be that this is a plan to grow the government. It's one of the several reasons that I voted against cap and trade. Even though I had this new constituency and I had this uh, learning at science committee and then this epiphany really of sort of a spiritual nature with my friend uh, Scott, still I voted against cap and trade because it's hopelessly complicated. It's embarrassing in the free allocation to the well-connected. It decimates American manufacturing. And it's a massive tax increase. So who could be for that? Um, and so uh, now, uh, apologies to the progressives in the room, because you think, well, listen, we, we did this to, to try to get you, Inglis. I mean, that's, what, that's who we were after. Because your man, George H.W. Bush, did it for acid rain. Well, yes, he did. The difference is. Very few point sources, very few manufacturers of the offending substances. Cap and trade worked. This is quite different. This is billions, literally billions of point sources. And a price signal would clearly work better than some sort of system of cap and trade. By the way, uh, maybe in Q&A you can ask me, uh, or you can see if you agree with this, but I would submit to you that cap and trade is graveyard dead. There are some people who think it can be resuscitated, but really it requires a resurrection, which is a larger miracle. It is graveyard dead. Um, and so, and it needs to be graveyard dead. Um, the other alternative traveling, by the way, is the president's approach of regulating CO2 through the Clean Air Act. Um, now, in fairness to him, if he were here, he'd say, I got to do it because the Supreme Court's told me I got to do it. And he'd be right in that. Because if you made the endangerment finding, it follows that you've got to uh, regulate CO2. But what I'd say back to him is, sir, can we think outside the box that you're apparently in? 
the box you're in is going to lead to a very bad outcome of America being a double loser. Because what you're going to do if you succeed after all the domestic litigation you have is you are going to have priced carbon through a clumsy mechanism of regulation with the result that it is domestic only. And as a consequence, uh, energy prices are going to rise here relative to other competitors. Uh, the result will be that productive capacity will pick up from America and move to higher energy intensive locations. So we lose employment and we increase global emissions. Double losers if that's the path we go on. So how about we find a different path? And this is what I'm finally getting to, which is a second imperative for us, which is it'd be a border adjustable tax. One was it's revenue neutral. We don't grow the government. That's one of the four problems that I see with cap and trade. But the other essential, and this is the difference between the president's regulatory approach, is you've got to figure out a way to get China in this. If China's not in this, this is a useless conversation because uh, you, you've got, we've got to figure a way to do that. Now, one approach is to send John Kerry over there and have him bow and scrape and maybe beg a little bit and seek an international agreement. Um, the other is to just make a very shrewd business move um, with some risk. But just do this, make it a border adjustable tax so that we pass a tax, a carbon tax, we pair it with a reduction in income taxes. But we put the carbon tax on and we say it is border adjustable so it's removed on exports, it's imposed on imports. The risk is it's WTO, a WTO problem. But we think we can win that argument and we'll go into that if you want to um, about how we can win that argument. And if we do win the argument, um, we figure that China, which is a place that has an amazing way of reaching consensus, um, will uh, follow suit very quickly. Because here's what they'd be facing. If it's upheld by the WTO, you can either pay the carbon content, carbon tax price on the entry of your Barbie dolls into America, and you can remit that to Washington, or you can go back to Beijing and collect it there and keep the money in China. So within 24 hours, we figure that they will, if it's upheld by the WTO, say, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's price carbon at the same level as the United States. All the Barbie dolls go straight into the Walmart shelves without any adjustment. And we are now pricing carbon in the same way. And I think, and you can help me figure out if I'm right about this, the comparative advantages of the trading partners remain virtually pretty much unchanged uh, because you've just increased, you've affected a worldwide increase in the price of energy. But actually, it's not really an increase. It's just reflecting the truer cost of energy, the actual cost. And we'll get into that if you want to about where, where those costs are currently hidden. Mostly it's a healthcare system. Um, so that's our. Those are our two imperatives, revenue neutrality and then border adjustment. And uh, it's a way of creating a, a, an income tax cutting uh, um, uh, China in uh, carbon tax. And uh, so um, let, me, let me throw a question to you. Um, and then I'll hear what other questions, but I want to hear an answer from you first. And then uh, you can ask questions and hear your comments. Um, the question I want to put to you is, I've just described a, um, a plan, right? This is a plan, and David Rokish is a friend from Capitol Hill, uh, and I were just having breakfast, and I was telling him about um, our, our challenge, not a problem, as our challenge, not a problem, uh, at the Energy and Enterprise Initiative, is that um, this is all about the head and not much about the heart. Um, which is a bigger challenge than the left has. We're, we're, the, we're the people in this space on the right, the new environmental right, which says these are economic problems and the environmental solution will follow if fix economics. The environmental left has a much easier time with the heart here. They would have a slide showing you a picture of a polar bear clinging to a piece of ice. 
And if you're a progressive, uh, you're what Dan Cahan at Yale says is a communitarian egalitarian, you would respond with an oh, and then you would write a check for $35 to the Sierra Club. Um, and uh, they'd be happy, and you'd be happy because you felt like you'd done something. Um, the challenge for us is most conservatives would prefer for Sarah to shoot that thing, and we put it right in front of the fireplace. Um, and so, um, <laughs> and so um, that's a problem for us, right? We can't show you a picture of a polar bear and say, oh, oh. No, we say, hmm, take aim. Um, so, uh, uh, so what we got to figure out is some way to get through to conservative hearts. They exist. If you're a progressive, we have hearts. Um, but uh, to get through the heart so we can get into the head, because what this is really is we've got, as Dean Russell Moore, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, told me a while back, he said, what you have here, Bob, is a heart problem, not a head problem. Uh, if you can get through the heart, you can get into the head. But it is bouncing off the heart. Um, and it's a huge challenge, and I hope you're about to give me the answer with just this little extra. The difference between acid rain and this, consider this. Acid rain is low salience. Nobody cared about it unless you were a hiker or a lumberman, right? Um, high complexity. The science was fairly, it was beyond me. Um, and it just got done. George H.W. Bush got with the Democratic Congress. Uh, we got all the manufacturers of that stuff in the room, said, listen, you're now capped. Trade underneath the cap. Problem solved. Climate change is a low salience issue. Um, that's what's reflected in current polling data, right? Is nobody cares about climate change. They care about jobs and the economy. They don't care about uh, climate change, low salience. It's higher complexity even than acid rain because you're trying to model the entire world climate system. Um, but it's become a cultural marker. And isn't that odd that it's a cultural marker? It indicates which tribe you're in. Um, I mean, if, you're, if you say it's real, oh, you're in the Al Gore tribe. Um, in fact, I had a primary opponent in 2008 who called me the Al Gore of the Republican Party. He didn't mean that as a compliment. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, so you, I'm hoping that you will tell me here how it is that we can connect on a belief level with conservatives. If you're a conservative or if you know one, uh, tell me now how we connect. I'm, I really, I want to, I'm hoping that you're going to come up with a great idea here on how to, uh, how to get through to the heart of this matter and, and identify a belief level. Suggestions? Uh, Yes, sir. I have your solution. Oh, good. I'm, I'm for you. David, write it down. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I, I am, um, I'm impressed by the level of passion that conservatives have about intergenerational equity when it comes to the economy. Oh, yeah. So there is a lot of concern about what we pass on to our children in terms of the debt. <clears throat> and it strikes me that it just seems like that's a a narrow way of thinking about what are the things that future generations will need. Certainly family is a, something that most conservatives hold as a really um, high value and that concern about what ultimately you know they pass on to their children, to their grandchildren is, is a place to start and this issue is very much all about that. So it seems like there's kind of a not a very far extension of that kind of logic that a lot of conservatives have around what they don't call it intergenerational equity, but essentially that's the idea around the debt. And in expanding that, say yes and. Um, it's not only about the, the economic um, you know, burden that we leave, but also the, the lack of resources to be able to build their own lives, the lack of a, a stable climate to be able to operate and flourish within. There's a whole lot of things that they need beside just a, you know, a balanced account to be able to flourish in future generations. So, so it strikes me that, that might be a pathway to sort of build on something that there is truly a lot of um, you know, uh, emotion around and commitment to in the, consu in the, um, in the uh, conservative community and, and could be, I think, extended to include these kinds of if issues if you see um, you know, what the long-term impacts of these things are likely to be on future generations. So anyway, I, I think that's maybe a, a place to start. Great. 
What, what do you think? Responses to his, his idea. Intergenerational equity is the uh, heart throb, the connector. Yes, sir. It works for the grassroots to a degree, especially with the religious audience, but I don't think that it works with the people who don't want the hidden costs of pollution to go away. And I think that really is the crux of your problem here. That we have vested interests who like it this way. You really like it this way. Yes, it, it's, it works well for them. As long as you can socialize your soot, um, it's really a pretty good deal for you, right? I mean, uh, socialize your, your costs, privatize your profits, I'm into that. Um, so, uh, I mean, if I'm in business, right? So, a good point. All right. So, we've got who else? This idea of intergenerational or some other idea. Yes, sir. Yeah, the economics of carbon tax. If you look at the economics of carbon tax, if you look at despite uh, car in California and I think there's a trade in Alberta, you know, CREs are dead. I mean, they went from probably about 17 euros in 2010, now they're at point. Zero one euro. So, you know, if you have the whole world, I mean, Copenhagen, I guess the U.S. and China didn't sign on, but if that economic reality is there, how do you plan to solve that? I mean, that would tell me the market's dead. Huh. Does that make sense? I mean, t tell me how uh, you're, you're raising a different point than uh, you're not saying. Well, I'm just saying an economic basis. I agree, should end all subsidies. I think there's a things like ethanol shouldn't be, you know used or incented to be used because you affect the farmers. But what I'm saying is there's really no economic basis. If you're trying to straight a whole new carbon tax economic policy, it's already failed on a UN level. I just, you know, I just tell me the economy doesn't accept that thesis. Oh, interesting. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, I, um, I, but let me answer, ask about this. Uh, how do I make this same point? Um, and, oh, I think right there. Um, this actually, you can tell me intergenerational is a way to reach, um, and then the fellow says that uh, we got a problem with the people with a vested interest. This, uh, is sort of what you were, part of what you were saying there is that this was our attempt, or is our continuing attempt to reach to my frenemies in the, in the Tea Party. Um, uh, it's actually working right now in Georgia. Anybody here from Georgia? Some very exciting happening in Georgia right now with the Green Tea Coalition. You heard about it? It's that basically the, the Georgia Tea Party and Sierra Club have combined to fight the monopoly of Georgia power, which is pretty amazing. Uh oh, is anybody on the panel, like the next panel from Georgia Power or Southern Company? <laughs> oh, shoo! I was afraid that I was getting ready to. Okay, so I got to tell you that uh, there's a joke about Georgia Power, which is. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, what's, the, what's the market price of a Georgia state legislator? Don't know, Southern Company hadn't sold one lately. Um, and so uh, uh, that's a, 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 a CEO of a very, very big uh, power company told me that joke. He says it's more in envy than in truth because we all envy their amazing relationship with the Georgia legislature. But if you can believe it, that, that became the heartthrob for the Tea Party to say, by golly, these folks have a monopoly, and we aren't for monopolies, we're for freedom. And so they said, uh, because Georgia Power is basically squashing solar installers who were installing and financing for the homeowner, because Georgia Power says, if you do that, you gotta be a power company. Um, and so, um, Tea Party got together with Sierra Club and the solar installers, and they beat Georgia Power in the Public Service Commission. And so now in Georgia, they're going to start uh, letting them, uh, solar installers will be able to finance uh, a solar system on your roof and uh, provide and sell power to Georgia Power. Um, so uh, that's one way to do it. Any other ideas? And then I'm, I'll open it up for more general questions. Yes, sir. Yes, I just uh, called the idea of conservative uh, sanctity lever was good, except that that's the only, uh, the environment's the only uh, progressive sanctity issue that they embrace, it seems like. So if they had, you know, if you could appeal to that, it would be great, except the progressives, you know, really don't care much for sanctity except with the environment. Yeah, interesting. I think you're, I think I know what you're talking about is, Jonathan, Hate, right? The righteous mind? 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Everybody know about that? Tell them a little bit about that, this, this idea. Well, it's, uh, it just talks about the different values, you know, cooperation and compassion and authority and then uh, sanctity. And, uh, of course, the conservatives are strong on all those values. The, the progressives just mainly concentrate on compassion and cooperation. But, uh, and so they have very little attraction to sanctity except for the environment. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, yeah, because uh, what, what you notice here is uh, we, we, you can't really make it out, but that says New York Stock Exchange. So you notice in our materials, we have no polar bears, as I said. We have the stock exchange. Uh, we have uh, flags that indicate American exceptionalism. Probably feels a little bit like it's the aftermath of 9-11, right? Um, that's where we're going. But the, if we chose to pursue that sanctity, because apparently conservatives, says Jonathan, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, hate, right? Um, uh, he says that uh, conservatives respond to purity. And uh, so they want... Uh, you know, things like sexual purity, they want things like, uh, you know, doctrinal purity, and they want sort of the purity of the earth. The challenge for us is if you put a picture of Mother Earth up there, well, first of all, she's not my mother, um, and um, it just drives, uh, it drives conservatives away. So we don't have any picture of Earth, certainly no polar bears, um, and uh, we tried this in my class, you know, I got my students to try to see, see, I'm still after this. I'm still reaching for this holy grail about what it is. You got an idea for me? Uh, well, I'll leave it with the state energy office, but uh, I have heard in the past from uh, some interfaith uh, climate change folks that respect for creation is a watchword that harkens back to a biblical reference and yeah. may have some play. Yes. By the way, does the legislature know you're here? Just kidding, just kidding. Don't answer that. Um, <laughs> don't answer that, just joking. <laughs> I know you all have a little bit of trouble here in North Carolina on some things like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, 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 and may it be that conservatives come back to the place of realizing that perhaps conservation and conservative have something in common. Uh, you know, if you phonetically make them out, conservative and conservation, perhaps there's some connection. Um, so, uh, yes, that's another possibility for us. Uh, we decided, I mean, I really am getting your marketing help here. I'm counting on Fuqua School to give me this help. We could have hung a flag, basically, uh, sort of a, a Christian fish or a stewardship kind of approach. Uh, while I feel comfortable talking in those terms, and that's who I am, I, we, don't, we chose not to do that because then you get in all kinds of questions about de deciding what's orthodox, and that's hard. Uh, we, we wanted to avoid that, so we decided to stick in the economics frame. There's another frame available, which is national security, perhaps somebody would say, which is big for conservatives. But I, one of my regrets in my career is not serving ever in uniform, and so I don't have any credibility on that. Um, of course, I'm not an economist either, I'm not a scientist. So, <laughs> well, um, but, uh, so we chose this economics frame, and the question is, can you warm that up to make it so that, gee, that's exciting. Um, maybe if you're Greg Mankiw at Harvard, you can make it exciting. You can make Ec-10 exciting. Um, but uh, yes, sir. One thing that I think, as far as branding, really needs to change is whenever you get onto an environmental issue, the message that conservatives are used to hearing is, you're the bad guy. You should feel you know, guilty. Yeah. We're, uh, we're riding our bicycles and drinking free trade coffee and you're destroying the planet. And I, I, I don't think that approach makes a whole lot of friends on the conservative side of the aisle. Now I see where a lot of people are going with the, uh, with the religious angle, but I would play that a little bit safe because that may not be where the younger generation of what could be conservatives would come from. But I do like the uh, aspect of the Tea Party angle that, that people are concerned with, um, with making sure it's, it's neutral, that we're going to do this a conservative way. If you wanted to take that further, like you said, you don't want to touch on the too much on the national security thing. But one aspect of it you can touch on is the hidden costs of protecting the international supply chain for oil 
and the fact that that comes out of not some future they still want to debate about where carbon is going to put you, that comes out of that uh, national debt thing that everybody is heart and soul concerned about. And in fact, the wars that we're involved in are the biggest expenses that the government has faced in the last 10 years. Yeah. One other angle I would face, I got two angles here. The second one is free competition. What uh, the message that you want to send is, well, I can't compete with that. The whole idea being, you, you know, you're not evil for doing X, Y, and Z, but that's where the market is. And if you don't do it, you're probably going to lose on price. And so what you really want to talk about is removing the unfair advantages to the other side and show it from the perspective of the guy who wants to compete. Right, great. Very, very helpful. Okay, so we'll, we'll end this part of you giving me advice and now ask whatever, or continue to give advice if you want to, but ask any question you want to or, or make any comment you want to. Who's got a microphone? You've got to help me see what, uh, there, there's a fellow with a microphone. Uh, who, who wants Richard. to, yes sir. Oh wait a minute, he's, he's handing the microphone. Hold on, we'll come up back to you. It, you were talking about the example of uh, Georgia and the, the Green Tea Coalition, and it, it seems to me that that's been successful towards being successful twice now. Once is in Georgia, and the other place is Arizona, where yes. the, the right, led by Barry Goldwater Jr., has taken the approach of the utility is exercising its mo monopoly power to remove my right to generate my own energy. And as an American, if I want to put a solar system on my roof and get economic value and energy from it, God damn it, that's my right. right. And uh, it's really working well there so far, and they're beating back some strong attacks by Arizona Public Service, funded by the, uh, the special interests that like socializing their pollution. Um, so, you know, a couple of good examples of the strength of that argument there. Great point. Yeah, it's spread to Arizona. There are 12 places, 12 states, I believe, right now where the green tea kind of concept is working. Um, and yes, uh, to, the, uh, to the point about people being very opposed and having a, a financial interest, they are funding the opposition to it, but they lost in Georgia. And uh, you're adding the information they're losing in Arizona. Um, by the way, in fairness to the, maybe the next panel that might have Duke Power on it or somebody like that, there, there is a point that needs to be made that, to balance this out for the utilities, which is the utilities do need to be paid some premium for the operation of the grid. Because if I go and do this at my house with, you, you know, you start a company and you finance my solar system on my roof, um, when the sun is shining, I want to flip the switch and that's where I'm counting on the grid and not your company. And so the utilities, in fairness to them, would say, listen, you got to work that into the system some way, that we basically get a premium for that reliability. But there's got to be a way to do that, but also give the freedom uh, that the Green Tea Coalition is right to focus on, right. seems to me. If I could. Yeah. I'd love to follow that up with a question, which is that you, you look at that slide and it seems like such a no-brainer. Why, why is it so hard to get it to happen? Why is it so hard to get through? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's what we're trying to figure out is why is this? It really could have a windmill and I could go tilt on it. Um, uh, actually, we are getting through. Uh, young conservatives get it. So I was last night at Wake Forest speaking to college Republicans. 12, uh, 12 students there, um, one hoaxer, and the rest either, there are three camps in here, you know, hoax, that's where I was, uh, English 1.0, real, but we don't know what causes it, and then real and human cause, that's where I am now. Um, there's only one hoaxer last night at uh, self-identified coming out to a meeting, Republicans, at Wake Forest. The rest were in one of the other two camps. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and at uh, business schools, I find it even a better percentage uh, because you thankfully see an opportunity to make some money on this. And unlike the environmental left, which shies away from that, gets a little bit uncomfortable about that kind of concept, we're over here saying, great, go make a lot of money. Um, uh, because we think that wealth creation is really terrific. It's like the guy that uh, runs the center we're part of, um, he said, Bob, before you take any money from ExxonMobil, 
let's talk. And I said, too late, Ed, I've already asked them, and they turned me down. Um, I mean, because uh, I've asked now three times. Anybody here from ExxonMobil, I really want you to be part of us, uh, because you can help us validate this message. What we don't need is, I mean, we, we love uh, pictures of wind turbines are fine for the environmental left, but what we need is a by golly manly man who's going down there and getting some natural gas for us. Um, that'll turn some conservative cranks. And uh, I asked the lobbyist for ExxonMobil, I said, who used to give me pack checks, speaking of money and politics and all that sort of thing and the financial interest, I said to her, uh, Jeannie, uh, if I'm in front of progressives and I say that I, uh, Rex Tillerson, CEO of ExxonMobil, is for this, for a carbon tax, he hadn't endorsed our concept, but if you read his public speeches, it's exactly what we're talking about. Um, we point for point agree with him. Um, and I said, you know, progressives don't believe me. They say that uh, you're just trying, what Rex Tillerson's trying to do is just kill cap and trade. She said, listen, we're in uh, petroleum and we think transportation will always be petroleum. And we also sell natural gas and natural gas can take coal. That's why we're for a carbon tax. I said, great. I can go tell conservatives they're into it to just make money. That's terrific. Because, you know, we don't believe this altruistic stuff, you know, that somebody comes along and says, oh no, they're just trying to be good corporate citizens. Nonsense, they're trying to make money. Well, great, good for them. If you have a competition where all the subsidies are removed uh, and, and all the costs are in, and your product beats the other guy's product, good for you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so Exxon, that, was a, that was a plea for ExxonMobil. Anybody that's going to go to work for ExxonMobil, I may be looking at the next CEO of ExxonMobil here. Would you please, uh, we may still be around, uh, help us out. Um, uh, yes, sir. Right over here. I'll do this without the microphone because I don't think I need it. Uh, the, uh, yeah. Our culture, meaning the American culture, does not respond well to negative narratives. And your you know, same facts will support, support a case for sustainability, which kind of portrays itself as a hand-wringing of, you know, if we don't make some changes, you know, we're going to perish. You know, we'll vanish from the earth. Yes. I think that the more positive narrative that you might want to embrace is the movement start, started around thriveability, which is we're smart, we're human, we can do better. And so if you latch on to the thrivability narrative and use that as an oppositional force to the sustainability narrative, which is just coming back to remediation, as opposed to we can do better, I think that that better notion really plays into the American character. And so that has some of the emotional energy that I believe you're looking for. Oh, that's terrific. Tell me your name is. Kevin Clark. And I suggest that I introduce you to Gene Russell, who writes you know, uh, extensively on this topic. Yes, Kevin, that's terrific. Uh, I'm going to quote you, because I think that is that, that's a great way to put it. Thrivability as opposed to sustainability. It's better than what we've been doing. We've been saying that Carlos Gutierrez, a recycler of PET in Spartanburg, South Carolina, gave us a definition of sustainability we use at the Energy and Enterprise Initiative, which is this. Carlos told me one time when I was touring his plant, when I was a member of Congress there, he says, uh, sustainability means making a profit. If you can make a profit, it's sustainable. If you can't, it's not. Um, right. And uh, so that's our um, definition. But I like if, this if you're, probability concept. That's very good. So I'll just add one other thought, which is, if you were in the oil industry right now at this pivotal point, knowing that it's a finite resource, there are only so many dinosaurs right, to, right. to extract, right? Yeah. And you're looking at the emergence of 3D printing and you know, being able to nanofabricate. Do you know how much it cost, would cost to fill a car with printer ink right now? No, I don't. $35,000. Really? OK, for the density of the structure of that particular liquid, fill your car up $35,000. Now, if you're an oil executive, ask yourself, do you want to burn what's left out of existence as fuel, or whether you rather charge $35,000 as a raw material Wow. All right. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. For what's left. Would you like to take a change in terms of what your business model is so that you can capture that higher value? 
because complex hydrocarbons are really flexible. They're really good for what's about to happen in the physical world. Interesting, so, very good point. Yeah. I think that you have some interesting opportunities to recast the narrative in ways that really create value, really create money, and push you toward that thrivability narrative. That's great. Thank you, Kevin. That's, that's very helpful. This uh, thrivability concept is, uh, I'm going to start quoting you on that. That's, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You um, hi, Bob. Uh, I really appreciate your spiritual aspect to this, the way you present it. A um, couple of things. Uh, there is a North Carolina Green Tea Alliance maybe happening. Um, there's group NC Warren, which is known as a left of center environmental watchdog group. Yeah. And they're talking with folks from John Locke um, who don't like Duke's monopoly status. Right. So there might be the beginnings of that here. Terrific. Uh, that's number one. Number two, as far as suggestions, I think um, Chris Matthews always says there's a mommy party and a daddy party. Republicans are definitely the daddy party who are protectors. They make the money. They protect us from bad guys. Um, I think one way you can frame this narrative is combining what two people said, which is we have certain bad guys who are getting away with polluting without a cost, and you can be the protector for your kids and grandkids. That someone's getting away with something now, and the, the people who will really be affected are your kids and grandkids, but you can do something about it because you have the ability to act now, and they don't. Yeah, that's true. Um, Number three, question, um, what do you think we can do in the Carolinas now with Duke Energy having such a large role here? I think they're the largest utility in the country, second in the world. How can we move them towards um, renewables and efficiency? Um, well, I, I, I knew uh, Jim Rogers. Uh, you know, Jim uh, came by a couple of times to see me in Congress, and really fascinating uh, discussions I had with him. Um, and I know that he was involved with U.S. CAP, um, so they have some sensitivity on these things. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what, after the merger what all that looks like. I assume there's still people that are very interested in uh, in taking action. They've got to deal with this reliability piece. Um, and so while we're excited about the Green Tea Coalition, they've got to figure out how to flip on that switch and make it reliable and be paid for that. Um, but I, I, don't, I, I hope there's a way to uh, continue to work with them. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, um, it depends on where you sit determines where you stand. Um, you know, that's true in politics and it's true in the boardroom if you're at a, a publicly, at an investor-owned utility. Um, you know, it just depends on what your mix is. If you're John Rowe, um, formerly of Exelon, uh, you know, uh, you're really for what we're talking about. John's uh, very helpful to us. If you're a Southern company, maybe you have a different point of view. And so uh, we're working through that. Almost out of time. Back in the back. Yes, ma'am. You... Hi. I'm from the panic where I go to do guaranteeing and so. Oh, oh, there we go. There you go. Uh, I kept raising my oh, hand I'm and uh, getting nothing, uh, but, uh, and I understand uh, everyone has their viewpoints. On the question of renewables, alternative energy, uh, we do have it and we are very pro-solar. We are the largest in the U.S., uh, the third largest in the world, uh, but many parts of this country, whether it's in Nevada, Utah, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Florida, we do have a large solar and renewable and alternative energy portfolio. I would be glad to share it with you. I do go around the country on an international and a national perspective discussing it. With respect to the grid, the question is, um, and we, we're pro the renewable, because we really do have it all, including nuclear, whether you're pro or, or against nuclear. But the question is, who will carry the cost of that asset, that fixed asset with the grid? And that's a transitional period. Right. It, and the question is, who can have solar and who cannot? We cannot leave the customers that cannot afford it out. That's the only question. Yes, great. Um, so uh, that, that's what I was talking about, but somehow the power companies have to figure out how to, get, how to have some premium for keeping the reliability going, right? 
Um, the other thing to, um, to, to add there, I guess, is that um, uh, it, it's a, uh, uh, you know, what feels good for a lot of people is what, um, what my friend uh, Mark Udall and Tom Udall are doing right now in the Senate with a renewable electricity standard, right? I, I like both of them very much. Um, but I think they're just, it's the wrong approach. It, it feels good, right? We're gonna mandate that Duke Power must have this level of renewables. But John Rowe uh, at Exelon educated me about this at an event we did at the Kellogg School of Business with him. Of course, he was uh, at a very advanced level and I was trying to hold on like this to understand what in the world he was talking about because he's a brilliant fella. But John explained to us that renewable electricity standards actually uh, actually cause really unintended consequences in power production. And so um, what happens is you continue to work your wind even though the grid is overcharged and actually you are being charged to put the power onto the grid from those wind units. But the reason you keep the wind going is you gotta suck down the tax credits because otherwise that whole thing collapses. And so the perverse incentive there is you keep the wind going and you take your nuclear down to a suboptimal level. And so now wind is really disadvantaging nuclear. And so what John says, and I think it makes sense to me as a free enterprise kind of conservative, is don't do any of that. Just let us decide how to do it. You just price carbon and we'll figure the rest of it out. Um, but if you go into uh, mandating to this company that you got to do it this way, then you really limit the freedom of Duke to figure out, hey, this is the best way we can do power here in North and South Carolina. Um, uh, they can do it differently in Arizona. Um, and uh, so that's why we're so excited about price signals and why I'm excited speaking at uh, business schools because I think you probably uh, agree with that kind of concept of price signals and then give freedom in the boardroom to make the decisions that you'll make. Um, Please visit, I think I'm out of time here. Um, you, you, please visit us at energyandenterprise.com. Uh, I guess we don't have the, uh, anyway, it's Energy and Enterprise Initiative at energyandenterprise.com. And uh, if you want to sign up to uh, continue to get uh, info from us, we'll track your ideas and you'll, you'll see some of the results as we uh, perfect our materials there and continue this campaign of educational campaign across the country. Thanks very much. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.